Thanks to MathX for sponsoring today's video. It's fairly common to say that mathematics is unreasonably effective at describing the natural world. Well, I posit that within mathematics, linear algebra is unreasonably effective at studying the rest of mathematics. And that's, well, what we'd like to look at today. And that is how we can explore some ideas that don't seem connected to linear algebra via linear algebra. So what's the big idea here? Well, you wanna start with a mathematical structure. You know, maybe that's gonna be a group or maybe that's gonna be some sort of algebraic structure or maybe that's gonna be the derivative or something. And then you wanna translate that mathematical structure into the language of linear algebra. And once you're in this linear algebraic setting, you can study this setup with the powerful tools of linear algebra. And so there are many, many powerful tools of linear algebra. We'll see some of them. And while studying inside of this linear algebra framework, you get more deep understanding of the original mathematical structure. Okay, so now that we have an overview of what we wanna to do today, let's jump into our first example. I'm really excited to tell you about the sponsor for today's video. Instead of like normal, when videos are sponsored by companies that wanna sell you things, this company wants to hire you for a job. So our video was sponsored by MattX. MattX is a company developing chips for large language models. By investing all of their silicon in this specialized application, their chip can perform much better than GPUs. And they're hiring software, compiler, machine learning, and silicon engineering roles. And I think probably there are many, many people out there in the audience that would be perfect for this type of position. So head over to mattx.com jobs for more information and to apply if you're interested. Thanks once again to Matt X for sponsoring today's video. So for our first setup, let's consider a four dimensional real vector space. I'll call it V. And I'm gonna span it by the following four functions. So let's recall the space of smooth functions makes a vector space. And this is simply a subspace of that larger vector space. So my four functions are X times sine X x times cosine of x, sine x, and cosine of x. But since this is four dimensional, it has four basis vectors, that means it's isomorphic to R4, where we think of that, that as just four entry column vectors. And that isomorphism can be given by the following rule, that this is how we wanna think about it. So x sine x is assigned to, well, sometimes that's called the vector E1. So it's one, zero, zero, zero. Then x cosine of x is the next standard basis vector, zero, one, zero, zero. Sine x will assign to zero, zero, one, zero. And finally, cosine x will assign to zero, 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 one. And what we wanna do here, well, there are a number of things we could do, but let's just see what the derivative does to our space V, and if we can turn that into a more familiar linear algebraic setup, which might involve a matrix. Okay, so let's maybe make a diagram first. Let's say we've got this map from V to V, which is given by simply taking the, der taking the derivative, and then we've got this assignment of V to R4 going down each of the sides. And then over here, we've got something that I'll call capital D, which we'll see will be a four by four matrix. And we wanna choose this capital D so that this is a so-called commutative diagram, which means we can start over here in capital V and take any path we want to R4 down here and we'll get the same result. That means that in this setup, capital D will be a representation of our derivative. Okay, but let's recall to get a matrix representation of any linear transformation, you really only need to know what it's doing to the basis vectors. So let's see that. So we've got the derivative with respect to x of x sine x equals what? 
Well, that's pretty easy with the product rule. We'll have x times cosine of x, and then plus sine of x. But then translating that into what we want this matrix to do, that means this matrix D should multiply into our vector 1, 0, 0, 0, and give us the vector 0, 1, 1, 0. That's because that's the vector of x sine x, and then the vector of x cos x plus sine of x. Okay, good. So this is giving us one idea of what's going on here with our matrix representation. Now let's look at another idea. So if we take the derivative with respect to x of x times cosine of x, again, we can use the product rule to give us minus x times sine x plus cosine of x. But if we turn this into matrix vector setup, that means d should multiply into our vector e2, the second standard basis vector, and give us negative 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay, nice. Now let's see what happens to the remaining two vectors. So if we take the derivative with respect to x of sine of x, we simply get cosine of x. But that means d on the vector 0, 0, 1, 0 should give us 0, 0, 0, 1. Just given the assignment that we're making throughout here, uh, you know, with the magenta underlines. And then finally, the derivative with respect to x of cos x is negative sine of x, but that means d on 0, 0, 0, 1 should be 0, 0, negative 1, 0. Okay, great. So there, we've got everything we need. We have D acting on all of the standard basis vectors. But that gives us the shape of D. So we can just read this off. So D will be 0, 1, 1, 0. So I'm reading this column wise. And then negative 1, 0, 0, 1. And then 0, 0, 0, 1, and finally 0, 0, minus 1, 0. Okay, so there we have it. Now, as an application, I'd like to take its inverse and think about, well, what's the inverse of the derivative? Well, it's the antiderivative, or the indefinite integral. And, well, I won't go through the details here, but d inverse can fairly easily be calculated to be 0, negative 1, 1, 0. That's our first column. And then 1, 0, 0, 1. That's our second column. And then 0, 0, 0, negative 1. And then finally, 0, 0, 1, 0. Great. So that means if we wanted to do something that would generally be kind of tricky, in fact, involve integration by parts, like the integral of x sine of x dx, we can instead think of this happening within the matrix vector world. So this should be d inverse of 1, 0, 0, where d inverse is, well, the matrix that I have up there. So you can do the matrix multiplication, and you'll see that this is equal to 0, negative 1, 1, 0. But then putting that back into terms of our sine x, cosine x, x sine x, and so on and so forth, we'll see that we get minus x cos x plus sine of x. Which of course we're missing the plus a constant, but that's because that's not encoded into this linear algebra setup here. But that is in fact the antiderivative that you would get by doing the integration by parts here. Okay, so let's look at another example. So for our next example, I'll do uh, an example of how a group may be represented in linear algebra via a matrix. And the group that we'll work with here is Zn, which is the set of equivalence classes modulo n. But we can really think about it just as the numbers 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1, where addition is done modulo n which means we take the normal sum of two numbers, but then divide by n and keep the remainder. In other words, we reduce mod n. So for example, so that we're all on the same page, inside of Z8, 
we have three plus seven. You might think that that's equal to 10, but if we divide by eight and keep the remainder, we get the number two. That's because the quotient would be one and then the remainder would be two. And then similarly, six plus five, that looks like 11, but mod eight is three. And then finally, if we look at something like four plus four, well, that's gonna be eight, but that's equal zero mod eight because it's a multiple of eight. But now what we'd like to do is somehow take elements of Z in and write them as matrices. And here's how we can do it. So we can in fact write these as two by two matrices with real entries. And the assignment goes like this. So we'll take the number M and we'll assign it to the following two by two matrix. So it'll be cosine of two pi M over N and then minus sine of two pi m over n. And then down here we'll have sine of two pi m over n. And then here we'll have cosine of two pi m over n. And let's maybe see why this works. And it all comes down to the fact that this really looks like a rotation matrix. And in fact, we've got this more general formula that if we have a cosine alpha, a minus sine alpha, a sine alpha, and a cosine alpha matrix, and then a similar cosine beta, minus sine beta, and then sine beta and cosine beta matrix, if we multiply these two matrices, well, I won't write it out long ways, but what you'll see is that the entries look suspiciously like the sum angle formulas for sine and cosine. And that gives us the following matrix, cosine of alpha plus beta, minus sine of alpha plus beta, and then here we have sine of alpha plus beta and cosine of alpha plus beta. So in fact, we've turned addition into matrix multiplication. So let's see. If we have L plus M happening inside of Zn, well, that should look like, well, this matrix multiplication with inside of M two by two R. So let's check that it works. So I'm just gonna copy these things down. Okay, so there's copying down the matrix associated to L and the matrix associated to M. But then by this sum rule that we had for the cosine and sine function, that's gonna give us in this top entry, the cosine of two pi and then L plus M over N. And then here we'll have minus sine of two pi and then L plus M over N. And then I'll just put stars down here for similar entries in the lower bit. But let's notice that sine and cosine are both two pi periodic. So that two pi periodicity here means that this addition is really working modulo n because we could divide by n and we'll simply get a multiple of two pi out of this right here. But you know, like I said, that's exactly the same as doing addition modulo n within this cosine function. And so that's allowed us to represent this addition modulo in as matrix multiplication in this, you know, set of matrices with entries in the real numbers. So just as a broader take, this is an example of a group representation. And the representation of groups is like a really important way to study, you know, groups in general. Okay, so let's end with one more kind of hint towards an application. Here's another brief glimpse into how linear algebra is used in kind of the modern world of data science and machine learning. And so broadly, we wanna think about ways to encode data into matrices. And then once that data is encoded into matrices, well, you might do a number of things with it. Perhaps you would do a so-called singular value decomposition or maybe you do some sort of other matrix factorization rule. 
and which one you choose will depend on exactly what parts of the data you'd like to highlight. So this is like really kind of a big subject at the moment, so I'm not gonna really go into it that deeply. It would take many, many hours. But just really briefly, you could like take a picture like this wonderful picture that I've drawn, and you could encode each pixel of this picture into a matrix via its color. So in other words, we've got this matrix over here and the size of the matrix is, well, it depends on the number of pixels kind of in the horizontal and vertical direction of this picture. And you go to a certain entry of this matrix and there's going to be a number in there. And that number is going to depend on the color of the pixel, like I said. And so that'll encode this picture into, you know, an array or a matrix if you want to think about it using linear algebra terminology. Another thing you could look at is a network or a graph. And so in a graph, you've got so-called vertices or nodes and you have edges, which are connections between the vertices or nodes. And so graph theory or maybe the study of these networks are kind of one and the same. And they have a lot of like really interesting applications into how the web works at the moment. So here's a really simple example. So we've got a graph with five vertices. So one, two, three, four, five is how I've labeled them. And we could encode this graph into something called an adjacency matrix. And in an adjacency matrix, you get zeros if nodes are not connected, or you get ones if nodes are connected. So let's notice that one has an edge from itself to itself and an edge to five. So that means one is connected to itself and to five. So that means in this first column, which is the column representing this first node one, you've got a one in the first entry and one in the fifth entry, but zeros everywhere else's. So that represents the connection to itself and to five. And then for all of the other nodes, you have similar ways of building those columns. So for example, the fourth node is connected to the second, the third, and itself. So if you go over here to this fourth column, you see that you have zeros in the first and the fifth entry, but one everywhere else. Okay, so there you have it. Three examples of how linear algebra is super useful in studying ideas from mathematics. And in fact, these areas of mathematics that we've looked at, you know, differential calculus and then group theory, and then, you know, maybe data science, seem to be pretty disconnected in their own right. So I think it's nice that linear algebra forms kind of a certain universal language for studying all of them. So maybe post in the comments your favorite application of linear algebra. And thanks for sticking around. That's a good place to stop.